Hi, welcome to Midwest Magic Cleaning. My name is Smooth. And this is episode three of fixing a house that's been through a lot. It's been through hoarders, a house fire. There are holes in the wall. The kitchen in the living room was just utterly stained with soot. The wallpaper in the kitchen was made out of asbestos. There are sheets hanging where curtains should be. The front door was just duct taped shut at one point. And I live in a very rural, repressed area of the country. So fixes like these are difficult for people because one, not a lot of people have this skill set. And two, for a lot of people, this is just unaffordable. You're talking about families that live not just check to check, but dollar to dollar. So even a $20 gallon of ceiling paint is out of the question for a lot of people. Fortunately, because everybody subscribed to the channel and it got so big, we're able to take the money that YouTube brings in and invest in my community. At some point, we'll be going across the country to help people out. But right now I'm focused on homes that are in my area that I can reasonably get to. And I can tell you that over the course of these last three videos, you all have made it possible for us to invest about $3,000 into this house. Again, for total strangers. So thank you so, so much just for being there and watching the videos. And if you haven't subscribed yet, every one of those subscribe clicks helps out the channel quite a bit. Now this house has two expensive items in it. One is this massive entertainment center. It's like 10 feet wide and almost seven feet tall. And it's one of those that has a kind of a floating shelf on top so you can move the side cabinets toward or away from each other in order to kind of customize the hole cut out where the TV would go. And it is extremely heavy. The second thing is a massive TV. It's like 75 to 78 inches. Now, the first reaction for most people would be like, well, if they can't afford to do blah, 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 then why do they have this giant TV? Well, one, it's none of your business. In my area, most people get a lot of their furniture especially their electronics around tax time. They get a tax return. They take a certain amount of money to get a new TV or a computer or whatever. And at places like Walmart, those gigantic TVs are so cheap nowadays that if you're going to be spending a few hundred dollars on just a normal everyday TV, it actually doesn't cost that much more to just get the giant version of it. The problem is that this living room is not really meant for a TV that size. And that cabinet plus the TV together are going over the top of a window, which makes it just look like a dungeon in here. I'm actually glad I didn't bring lighting with me because it gives you an idea of how dark and depressing this living room was before we started it. Now the TV itself is sitting on a dresser because it's so big that there's not really a stand around that it can fit on without the legs sliding off the edge. So we ended up buying them a brand new TV stand, which you'll see a little bit later in this video. But it presented us with a problem. I didn't want that TV over the top of that window because this desperately needs some light. After kind of mulling over that situation for a bit, the owner pointed out that that gigantic entertainment center happened to be the same exact size of an archway that went into a little storage room. So if we were to take the end cases and put them wall to wall, the top of that would fit right over that archway and it would look like built-in bookshelves or built-in cabinetry. Then we could just put the new TV stand and the TV on the opposite wall and the little love seat that they've got right in front of the window that allows them to watch TV, move that gigantic case and still allow light into the room. So we took all the stuff off of that case. Now I could have just picked that up and moved it myself because I'm so gigantic and huge. Hawking is what a lot of people refer to me, Stephen Hawking, but I didn't want to embarrass Jason. So I let him help me move that. And in the process, we had to deal with a whole bunch of wiring. They had one wire that was ran through a wall that was hardwired to their router. And there was an old 19, somewhere between the 1920s and 1950s, like a hanging lamp sort of deal. We had to figure out where all the wiring in the house was going to go after we moved it. Otherwise, we could have like a conundrum. I, I don't put up with conundrums, but we would have had to have if we didn't check where every wire went. So there was a little bit of planning in moving the case, not just because we're taking up new space with it, but because that's like their central hub for all of their internet and Wi-Fi and all that. Plus, once we moved it, we had to make sure they still had room to keep all their pet moose and their pet yaks. You wanted those to be able to stay in their own area and just not roam freely throughout the house, like frolicking throughout your kitchen, yakking it up, doing yak stuff all over your floors. But we made it work. And as we move stuff, we're cleaning as we go because this room is so small. You can't really take everything out of it, then clean it, then put everything back because there's no room to put the stuff that you're moving. 
thing. So this was a case where since we know we're moving that giant entertainment center, it would be move part of it, clean the area behind it, move the second section, clean the area behind that, then put the top on, then move the couch, clean the area around it. It's a slow, tedious process. Now, fortunately for us, the wife in this family is extremely clean. She cleans all the time. The stuff that you're seeing us do in this video is more mechanical fixing type of stuff and painting. We're covering up stains, whereas she's really good about cleaning the actual dirt off. So the floors are always vacuumed. Everything's always wiped down. That's so rare on this channel. If you've been around the channel for a while, you know that we normally deal with houses that are extremely dirty, like so dirty that some people can't even watch the videos. But she always had the house nice and tidied up when we got there. If we left a mess whenever we went home for the night, the next day we would come in and it would be spotless. That makes me really proud and I know that they'll keep this this way because she's so involved in making sure she's doing the best with what she has. Now one thing that did drive me crazy is there's plastic around the edge of their TV that has never been pulled off and it's because I believe the husband has OCD and he can't quite bring himself to remove that plastic off of there. It's just one of his personal quirks. The quirk doesn't drive me crazy. The plastic does. So I told the wife, I said, before I leave, there's every chance I may just pull that plastic off and you can just blame it on me. <laughs> and she said, no, it's it's fine. If you want to pull that off, it's fine. She's like, he probably won't even notice. But I, I laugh about that. But if somebody does have genuine OCD or they've got extreme anxiety or ADHD, you can't just go in and do the thing that they don't want you to do because you can exacerbate their anxiety really badly. The plastic isn't hurting anything. There is no need for me to pull that stuff off. It would make me just a huge douchebag and would give him anxiety for no reason whatsoever. So I just left it on there. Now, the reason I assign that as an OCD trait is because I found several pieces of electronics in the house that all had the plastic still on it. And when I brought it up to the wife, she had mentioned that that was kind of a quirk. I'm also pretty sure that he has at least a low level hoarding disorder. He has trouble getting rid of things and he has a lot of trouble with change. But the wife keeps him in check. She makes sure everything's clean. She'll let him keep stuff within reason. And the fact that he's willing to negotiate on those sorts of things is a really good sign for him mentally. Now I explained this in the other video, but if you're wondering where all the holes in the wall came from, they had some roommates that were, let's say, undesirable. They've gotten rid of the roommates, thankfully, but while those roommates were there, they did quite a bit of destroying. A large hole in the living room was put there by a bigger guy who had fallen through the wall, like tripped and fell through the wall. Like he made a, a hole with his butt. He made a literal butt hole. In one of the first pictures you saw at the beginning of this video, there's a giant hole with teeth marks around it. Like like it had been chewed. That was a dog that chewed through the wall. A lot of the people who lived there worked at night, so the windows have blackout curtains. One set of windows in a spare bedroom basically has a blanket stapled to the windows, and then it's plasticed over the top of that to make a complete blackout. We're going to be getting rid of that. But that's also one of the areas where that compromise is really important, because the husband is always gone at work. He works very, very long hours. As far as I understand from speaking to the wife, 
He's the one who doesn't like light pouring into the house, even in like the living room or the kitchen. However, since she's there a hundred percent of the time, she's the one who has to deal with that depression factory. That lack of light coming into the house can just be a, a factory for depression. So one of the best things that we can do for her is to get some curtains that at least allow some light into the house while still respecting the fact that he works late and needs things like blackout curtains or the window sealed up or something in the bedroom to make it really, really dark so he can get his sleep. So I never go into a house and think this is the way we're going to do it because that's what I want. It's not my house. I have to take their decorations and their style into account. I have to take their interests into account. I take into account functionality and how they exist and how they operate as humans from day to day. I have them pick out their own colors, their own style, and then I build my plan around that. The way I see it is my job is not to make this into something that I could live in. It's to make it something that they can live in. Because if it was something that I liked, it would be the whole place would be covered in skulls. And like I would put paint on my butt and put butt prints all over the walls. You know, those signs that people put in their kitchens that just say eat. I'd put one of those in the bathroom and only the bathroom. I would also make a sign that said live, laugh, die. So yeah, it's way better that I have their input rather than me just going in there and going hog wild. So this is the TV stand that we got them. And I have one of these myself. It fits an 80 inch TV like to the millimeter and it's got a built in space heater that makes a fake like holographic fire. Then it's got two glass shelves. It, technically it's got four, but you can really only use two of them if you're putting like a PlayStation or something in one side. But it'll shine LEDs through the glass long ways, which makes the glass light up and the edges of the glass glow almost like a lightsaber. And you can change the colors of the flames and the LEDs and all that. It's just super cool cool and it's a nice neat feature instead of putting their TV on a dresser. If you're wondering where I got that, if you're interested in finding one for yourself, I found mine at Menards. If you don't know what Menards is, it means you don't live in the Midwest. Though you can go to Menards.com, I think, and track them down. I think they deliver, but I, I don't know. That's where I found mine, so suck it. But that TV looks so much better on that than it did sandwiched in between that gigantic entertainment center. And by moving that entertainment center over to the archway and by putting the TV on the new TV stand, it made their living room look literally twice as big because the living room itself is really long, but it's also really narrow. So now with the TV pushed against the opposite wall and the couch in front of the window and the bookshelf by the archway, we took care of that squeeze together problem. And with a TV that big, you want as much space between you and that TV as possible. Otherwise, you can't even enjoy that gigantic thing. That's what she said. I'm so sorry. She did not say that. She did. She did say. So I've got like an inch back here. What your mom say? <laughs> okay. Pulling out zingers now. That's perfect. If this, if this thing was any smaller, <laughs> yeah. this would not fit. <laughs> That's bananas. Once we had those things taken care of, we wanted to patch up the, the drywall holes because I wanted the drywall mud to be able to set overnight. The way I fixed the first hole is not the way you typically fix these. This one was sitting in a really weird area where part of it was on studs, part of it wasn't, part of it was floating, part of it could be anchored. And then we had a weird cut of drywall that we were using as a patch that wasn't quite long enough to patch the hole all in one shot. So we had to use two pieces. So the way we're doing 
this patch is not the way I'd suggest you do it yourself. We're going to cut this out roughly square shaped or rectangle shaped, and then we're going to measure the patch to fit in there. I'll show you the way you're supposed to do it here in just a minute when we patch the other room. This also gave me an excuse to buy some tools that I've been wanting to buy for a long time. One is an all purpose tool. It's like an oscillating saw or not an all purpose tool. It doesn't, it does not work with all purposes. It's a multi tool, but the, the most important part of that's the oscillating saw because it's almost like a spatula and it vibrates back and forth so that you can cut right up against door frames and then right up against floors and ceilings. It makes doing patchwork like this way easier. And I finally got myself an impact drill or a hammer drill because in all my old videos, if you see me using a drill or a screw gun, it's always got a cord hanging out the bottom of it. And you might also notice that it sucks. So I specifically looked for a drill that doesn't suck. I got a suckless drill, a drill that's virtually devoid of suck. But yeah, I won't go into big detail about how to drywall patch this because I'll, I'll do that in the other room. But we're just going to cut that hole out, measure the drywall to fit in there, slap it in, screw it in, put on some tape and drywall mud, let it dry and then sand it down. So that's basically all the steps to do it, even though I just said that I wasn't going to give you the steps. <laughs> but don't follow those steps because I'll show you the easier way to do it here in a second. Okay, so here's the way you're supposed to do these to make it super easy. First, we're gonna measure the size of this hole in roughly a square shape. So we're gonna measure out from the furthest point of the hole and then maybe add an inch or something like that to it so that if we were to cut that out in a square, that's the dimensions we're gonna look for. We're then gonna go over to the drywall and cut out a square that's roughly that size. The biggest part here is we want that square to be slightly bigger than the hole that we're gonna be patching. By using this method, we're not going to have to get exact measurements because what we'll do is we'll take that big old piece of patch, we'll bring it over to the hole, lay that right over the top of the hole, and then we'll take a marker and just outline the patch itself. Then we can take our multi-tool or a box knife and we can cut along that outline. And if we do that right, the new patch will fit perfectly into the place that we just cut out. So we're purposely making the hole bigger in order to accommodate the patch. But we're using the patch 
match in order to dictate the exact shape and size that we need to cut that hole. And after that, it's just a case of putting it in, screwing it to the wall, and then doing your tape and mud job. I won't show that full process in this video because this is a room that we'll be working on next week. I just wanted to get these patches up because they were tired of looking at those holes and I don't blame them. Also, if you're wondering why we didn't insulate that, there's two reasons. One, the only insulation I could find came in a 32 foot roll and I drive a Camaro and there was no room to put that in there. And two, I brought some spray foam to put in there as at least some makeshift insulation and I just flat out forgot to put it in. I did that with all three holes that we patched. I patched them up and then Jason was like, oh, by the way, you were supposed to put that spray foam in there. And I was like, well, I guess it's too late now. But as far as I could tell, the insulation only was removed where the holes existed. There was insulation above it and below the holes because I had to actually situate that to get the patches in correctly. So they do have insulation, but just not where the holes are. Once we wrapped that up, we went home for the night and allowed the drywall mud to completely dry. The next day we came back and started sanding and the one sucky part about this was I have a palm sander and I just completely spaced bringing it with me. And we're so far away from a store way out in the boondocks that we couldn't just run back and get a palm sander. It's way too far to drive. Remember, this is country country. So if you're like, well, why didn't you go to a nearby store? It's like, what, what nearby store? There's houses and corn and that's it. And now that we're into January, the corn doesn't even exist. So that meant we had to sand by hand, bam balam, and the only way to get through this is to grit your teeth and power through it. So I had Jason sand until his arm got tired, then I sanded for a bit until my arm got tired, and we went back and forth and back and forth until all the high spots and all the divots were gone. All we're trying to do is make this smooth, but we're not trying to make it perfect because we don't know what the hell we're doing. We're not drywall people. We just wanted it to look 
a lot better than it did before we got there. And literally anything could have looked better than that giant hole in the wall. So we sanded and sanded and sanded. And then after we were done with that, we wiped down the wall with just a dry rag. And then Jason used a shop vac to get all the dust up because we're getting ready to paint this here shortly. And if the wall is covered with gypsum dust, the primer or the paint's never going to stick to it. It'd be like trying to paint a powdered donut. It just, it's not happening. It's not happening, Bill. Bill, once we were done with all the sanding, with thank God, we had to pull off as much of the old wallpaper as possible. And this is the only time I've ever done some work in which I was glad that the people who originally did it sucked at it. Because I think this was just peel and stick wallpaper. I don't think they used wallpaper paste. And it was really, really old. It was no longer adhered to the wall. So for the most part, we could just pull a lot of this off in gigantic sheets. But we really needed to do that because... Since it wasn't adhered very well, it wouldn't make sense to put paint over the top of it. And whatever paint they used on it last looks to be oil-based to me or some sort of really slick paint. So I don't think our paint would have stuck to it very well. It would be much better to just go back down to bare drywall, prime that, and then paint it from scratch. Now we couldn't get all of the, the wallpaper off. The stuff that was really adhered really well, we just left and painted over. Again, we're not trying to get this perfect. We're trying to take what we have and make the best out of it. And I'm not about to spend a full day taking off every single last scrap of wallpaper. If we were renovating a house to sell or we're trying to make some perfect HGTV looking deal, then we'd do something like that. But here, the time is as valuable as the materials that we're buying to fix this place up. In most cases, the time is considerably more valuable. While I have you here, if you like what we're doing and you would like to support the channel in more of a way than just subscribe, and subscribing is the number one thing you can do to support us. We have a member section where I give an extra video every Wednesday for the mid tier. The bottom tier gets you access to Discord where you can hang out and BS with us all. And then there's a top tier that's just for people who want to support the channel in a more major way. That tier, when I can, I do a live stream of me doing these places in real time for just them. I can't always pull that off, but the people who are on that that tier aren't there because they want the perks. They're there because they want to support the channel. It's a ridiculous price. Please don't go in there and do that unless you have the money to do it. And in fact, I don't want people becoming a member at all if they can't afford it. That's not what this channel is about. Jason and I are doing fine financially. If we weren't, we wouldn't be doing stuff like this. If you like really stupid t-shirts and mugs and this normal merch stuff that you find on every YouTube channel, we do have merch. All that stuff is linked in the descriptions of all my videos. The member section, the merch shop, my real Facebook page, all that stuff is linked in the description. Yes, there are several fake Facebook pages out there, and I've got people working on getting those taken down. The real one is linked here on YouTube. Or is it? Yes, it actually is. But if you don't have the money to do all that, just subscribe. That's the, that's the best thing you can do. It's totally free. And we're approaching half a million subscribers as of this video. We've only, I think we're only less than 80,000 away from that. And at a million subscribers, we get a gold plaque, which is the one thing that I personally want out of the channel. It's my one greedy wish that I want is the, the gold plaque. That way I can walk up to perfect strangers and I will be wearing the plaque around my neck off a necklace like Flavor Flav's clock. And then I'll, I'll, I'll see like strangers at the store and I'll be like, hey, when you polish your gold plaque from YouTube, what do you, oh wait, I'm sorry. I just realized you don't have a gold plaque from YouTube. I'll go find somebody who has one and then ask them that question. And then I'll turn to myself and I'll say, hey me, when I polish my gold plaque from YouTube, what's the best polish? Because I'm the only one in my town who has one, son. And if they don't like that, they can go straight to heck. Once we get all the wallpaper off, we're finally ready to start priming. And the upside to priming a room like this is that we're doing everything, the walls and the ceiling. So when we're trimming, that, that trim only exists exists so that we can get places that the roller can't get to. But that also means that we can just slop that stuff on because we don't have to worry about accidentally getting it on something that's not supposed to have primer on it because everything's getting primer. The downside is that we're painting into bare drywall that has old drywall glue on it or old wallpaper glue and that stuff just sucks in paint and primer like a sponge. So we have to use a lot of primer on that and on the ceiling because the ceiling is that 
that old school 1970s foam look and stuff. And it may even be older than that. I mean, there's a chance that could be from the 20s, 30s, 40s. And there's every chance that could be asbestos as well, which is an, another reason we want to coat that heavy in primer and give it a really good coat of sealing paint to sort of just seal that stuff away. Because there's no way they've got the money to take that sealing out and replace it. And as long as it's not being disturbed or cut, it should be perfectly safe to live with. Like they, they don't want to be eating chunks of the ceiling. That would be bad. But just having the ceiling exist, that's fine. The first coat of this primer always takes forever. It takes a ton of paint. It takes a ton of effort. But once you have that first coat in place, you let that dry and cure and it forms a shell like an M&M candy shell. That way the second coat of primer that you put on just glides right across it. And in a situation like this, we do want two coats of primer. In a newer makeover, you can get away with one coat of primer, no big deal. But this one, you definitely want two and we could have even gone with three and it wouldn't have been overkill. So we're going to speed through this because this is kind of boring <laughs> and just watching people put paint on. But strangely, whenever you speed it up, it has the opposite effect. It looks cool. Also, you're seeing a lot of Jason in this video because I'm actually using this house to teach him a lot of new skills. There are a lot of things in his own house that are similar, maybe not this extreme, but they need to be fixed. And by doing this with me and with me teaching him how to do these new skills, he should be able to take that knowledge to his own home and improve it. I think a lot of people see a hole in drywall and then think, well, I guess that's just there now because there's no way I can afford to have somebody come over and patch that. But I don't think a lot of people know how easy it is to actually do yourself and really how inexpensive it can be depending on how big the hole is. Or they may look at the ceiling and the walls and think, God, it's so dingy in here. I wish I could afford to have this painted. But they don't realize that like one gallon of paint in most circumstances can paint a whole room and then some. Jason also happens to be one of those people who learns better hands-on than he does by instruction. So I may tell him how to do this, but it's not really going to sink in until I tell him and then show him and then have him do. So I will say, here's how to cut in a line of paint without getting it on the ceiling. Then I'll show him how I do it. Then I'll actually put the brush in his hand and have him do it himself. And then as he gets better and better at it, he can graduate to more complex jobs. Like, okay, you've learned how to cut in along the ceiling without getting paint on the ceiling. Now we're going to teach you how to put mascara on this ostrich. You don't want people doing that right off the bat as their first job. But once you see they have a steady hand, then they can graduate to that. Pretty ostriches don't just happen. It takes practice and a confident hand to pull that off. Now, for those of you who are wondering, we have one more room to do after this one that won't appear in this video. So we will have one more episode in this series before we move to the next series. At some point, I would like to come back to this house and do some flooring. I'd like to refloor their kitchen, which desperately needs it. You can even see that in the backgrounds of some of these shots. It's just super old tile that served its purpose and now it's all broken up and ready to be yanked and refloored. But before I do that, 
that. I want to use my own house as a guinea pig to make sure that I'm not going to go in there and make it look stupid because I have at least one floor that I need to put vinyl planking on. And if I mess that up in my own house, who cares? It's my house. But I don't want to go into somebody else's house and do just a half ass job on it. When I do a house, I want to go whole ass. I want to go ass whole on a, on a project. Don't get mad because I made that joke. We're all adults. Grow up. I regret nothing. But yeah, we're going back this week to do that last spare room. The spare room is being converted into a kid's room. So we are wanting to, we've already patched the holes in there, but we're wanting to paint it, fix some more wall stuff, put some nice kid stuff in there. Then all the spare paint that we have left over, we're going to leave at that house. That way they can do their own bedroom. And in case they have to touch things up, they'll have the correct colors there and the correct brand. So everything matches. Then at some point in the near future, I'm going to be working on my own house for a couple of videos. I have purposely let my garage go straight to hell for the last, I don't know, year. It started to get like a giant collection of boxes, then a bunch of old furniture that we couldn't really take to the dump. So I told my wife, just start throwing everything out there. I'll make a video out of it at some point. So it looks like a hoarder nightmare in my garage. It's piled up like eight feet tall, maybe even bigger. There's exactly enough room to get my car inside and no more room. So I'm going to rent a dumpster, get rid of all that stuff on a video. I've got a bunch of stuff in my backyard that needs cleaned up. Then after that, we have at least one more person who's going to get the treatment that we're giving these current people. They live in a trailer and I know there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs fixed and upgraded and painted. Probably get them some new furniture as well, but that'll be its own standalone series just like this one is.
One thing I'd like you to pay attention to is the ceiling because holy crap, this was another case where as we're putting on the primer, we're thinking, how can it get any better than that? That is such a dramatic difference just with primer that we couldn't imagine it getting any wider than it was currently getting just from the primer itself. Then when we put the actual ceiling paint on, it got twice that white. That by itself changes the mood of an entire room because the lights now have something to reflect off of. In its previous state, it was covered in soot, and that black is absorbing the light, preventing it from bouncing around the room. Once we got the primer and the ceiling paint on, that gives the light something to bounce off of, and the mood in the room changes so dramatically you can feel it. Areas that were previously like dungeon-esque and dark suddenly had light that could reach it, and it made the room feel way bigger and a whole lot less depressing. When the wife came into this room, she stopped and covered her mouth and went, oh my God. She called us miracle workers, which I thought was really cool. Though I think I'd rather be called a miracle flinger because I fling miracles. Yo, man, is that old miracle flinging Johnny? I don't know. Let's ask for a miracle and see how he delivers it. I bet he flings it. And I would fling it. Fling a miracle right in your face, son. All up in your face zone. Now, one thing you'll notice is that we moved that giant entertainment center around that archway and then we did not paint behind it. And that was by design. Once we moved that out of the way, that was so heavy that it ended up straining my back and Jason's shoulder. So we painted around that sucker. If they ever want to move that again, one, they would be crazy. That thing should never be moved ever again by anyone for any reason. But even if they did, we're, since they're going to have the paint there whenever we leave, they can just move that and then paint. A, it's like a four foot by six foot section that would need to be just quickly rolled. I was also going to paint the window frames gray because the paneling in this room is going to be painted gray. All the rest of the walls are going to be painted eggshell white. And if I would have painted the framework of the doors and the windows gray and even the baseboards, it would have given it a lot more character. But they have enough in this room that all that's going to be covered up. Curtains are going to completely cover this window. All the baseboards will be covered up by some form or another of furniture and bookshelves and whatnot. So it would have been a lot of work for results that you'd basically not even see. If they didn't need that storage room back there, in a perfect world, I would have put the TV in that entertainment center and just blocked that off. And instead of the dresser to house the TV, I would have just used the new TV stand that we bought them. But the room behind it is actually being used, so we couldn't really do that. But that would have been the perfect way to solve the room issue because then we could have just put the love seat in the middle of the living room long ways and you could just adjust the distance between the love seat and the TV in any way you saw fit. But as it sat, everything had to be kind of smushed together in that little section and they're just kind of forced to deal with how narrow the room is. There was literally no other way to do it. I mean, besides like mounting the TV directly to the ceiling facing downwards and then they could only watch it if they laid on their backs in the middle of the floor. That would have given them more room that way, but nobody ever likes my ideas of TV ceiling mounting.
After the ceiling was primed, it was a waiting game. We just had to wait for it to dry because I wanted this room entirely done on that day, which is a Saturday. I did not want to have to come back on a Sunday. I wanted to be able to get the video done and edited so that I can take a couple of days off and relax. But that meant that after the primer was on, we just had to wait for it to dry so that we could come back and start putting paint on. So while that was drying, I took a sheet off of the storage room that had just been stapled to the wall and I got him a nice curtain rod and a nice set of curtains and hung those up in its place. That at least made the archway look more theatrical and it covered up the things that they were storing in that room. A surprisingly large part of our budget went into curtains. I think all in all we bought somewhere between seven and ten sets of curtains and even at Walmart those things aren't cheap. We also got um, higher end curtain rods too because I hate when somebody gets a decent set of curtains and then has this flimsy little floppy curtain rod that bows in the middle whenever you get too much weight on it. So I splurged on the curtain rods and got really nice metal ones that had little marble balls on the ends of them. <laughs> I said balls. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Then I got sturdy hooks that pushed them out quite a ways to where I could put the hooks on the walls themselves instead of the window frame. Then hang 84 inch curtains closer to the ceiling so they covered more area. It just makes your, your windows look way bigger to do it that way. And it's the same with that archway. I wanted it to cover the entire archway and make it look sort of uh, like a stage curtain except more decorative. After the curtains were up, it was just time to start trimming out with actual paint. And that's a pretty quick job because we're putting paint on primer instead of just the wall. The walls tend to absorb paint, so it takes a whole lot more of it in order to get your coats on. But primer just lets you glide that sucker on there. Again, we're painting the paneled wall gray and all the other walls white. Since we already have two coats of primer on the wall and the primer itself is white, it means we could get away with painting one coat of eggshell white on the rest of the walls, one coat of ceiling white on the ceiling, and then two coats of gray on the paneled wall. Normally, if I'd have time, I'd do two coats of ceiling white and two coats of eggshell white, but on this particular room, it didn't make much difference. Plus, I was exhausted and I just wanted to go home, man. One of the worst parts of painting to me is waiting for it to dry. So if we're doing this in stages, it's okay to like do, say, a coat of paint one day, then go home, come back the next day, do another. If I was painting my house, I don't mind doing that because I live there and I can just wake up the next day and continue where I left off. But when you're making videos like this, I'm driving 35 miles there and 35 miles back every day. Every single day I'm driving 70 miles to do this house. So I want to get as much done as humanly possible while I'm there in order to make the trip worth it. Or I should say to get as much value out of the trip as possible. So when you're doing that in a place like this and you get one coat of paint on or you're you're getting the first coat of primer on and you're having to wait to do the second coat, a lot of times if you run out of things to do like hanging curtains or whatever, the only thing you can do is just sit there and wait. And when you're waiting for paint to dry, it feels like it takes five times longer compared to if you had something else to do in between those coats. Of course, the obvious hard part is that if you're doing a whole room front to finish in one day, it's not just a tedious activity, which is one of the reasons people hate painting, but it also makes you really sore. I don't have to use painting sticks that screw into your roller because I'm six foot four and most places I can just paint without a stick. But the drawback to that is yes, you gain speed while doing it, but it also exhausts you because your arms are constantly above your head and you're constantly going up and down and going from kneeling to standing and you're doing that for hours on end. I've worked a lot of physical jobs in my life and strangely painting is up there in probably the top five of the most exhausting jobs that I've done. And I've been a roofer. I've worked factories and warehouses. I've been a lawn worker and pack mule, but painting just wears me out. But there's one thing that I tried to instill in Jason, which I think he finally understood in this job, which is there are certain jobs that are so exhausting and you just want them to end. And all day you can, all you can think about is I want this to be done because I hate doing this thing. But whenever you're done and you do a good job on it and you look back and see the final finished product, that positive feeling that you get from that blows away all the negative feelings that you had while doing it. The exhaustion was totally, totally worth it when I pulled out my phone to do the after pictures. It was so dramatic of a change that it felt to me like we took pictures of the, the house before we started and then it felt like we finished 
then went to another house to take the after pictures. It was that big of a change. And the appreciation that this family showed when we got done with it is so worth it to me. They were living in this dungeon, dark, depressing, soot-covered room that needed desperate repairs. And by the time we got done with it, it looked like your average, everyday, just family home. The white looked so good. The grays looked so good together. And all that soot stain was completely removed just from a coat of primer and one coat of ceiling paint and made them really happy, which makes me really happy. Again, we'll have one more episode of this next week. We're going to go back and finish out that one room. Thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. If you've already subscribed, please continue to be subscribed. And if subscribing is against your religion, find another religion. Members, I'll see you all this Wednesday. Everybody else, I'll see you next weekend. Later.